bitch. Yo, what up? I've been pugging a lot of keys this season, and I've noticed that people have been struggling a lot with more overtuned dungeons like no Nelfaris. I figured I would make this video or some tips and tricks on how to time this on a higher key. So starting with this dungeon, I would prefer to go left side first, just because of how Magma Tusk is one of the more overtuned bosses, and you'll want to get it out of the way as soon as possible, just to know if your key is depleted or not. So the biggest limitations on these pulls on the left side will be the Falmaturges. You will want to pull as big as possible with only one Falmaturge. As you can see, we pulled the two in the beginning, one pack, and this pack up here with a Falmaturge. It does Magma Conflag and Molten Core. Magma Conflag will require a stop, and Molten Core will require multiple kicks. You'll want to focus it down first too. If either of those casts go off, it's pretty dangerous. And once that dies, you can freely chain if you are feeling tanky. There isn't a lot of group damage, as long as people aren't getting hit by the frontal. As you can see, we chain here, stop the Magma Conflag, and watch kicks on Molten Core. I have the Falmaturge also with a different plater color, just to know that it's the mob that requires stops. So if Magma Conflag ever does go off, you will want to use a defensive on it or provide an external. So as a prop paladin, I should be keeping track of who it's on or if you're a healer. Like in this situation, I would sack Twix if nobody is stopping the Magma Conflag. Or if I was a healer, you can provide extra healing or externals to the person that is being targeted. So once these Falmaturges die, you can just freely chain and that's pretty much what we do. You'll want to fight as little trash count here as possible just because the mobs here aren't very worth you'll have much easier count towards the end of the dungeon so once we clear out the trash here there will be this bottle over here that you can pick up which is supposed to be an achievement item that will instantly give magma tusk five stacks but currently there is a cheese you can use which will probably get fixed to be honest now in terms of how you want to play this fight you want to keep the boss still for the most part the boss will periodically poop out these puddles, but these puddles will never be able to go on the boss directly. As you can see here, it's spawning puddles around the boss. The only time you will want to move the boss is when it does a charge into a puddle. So charges are the only times where you'll want to make big movement. In terms of where you want to position the mammoth, you want to keep it relatively close to the center at all times. That way the charges won't go too far nor will they go too short. If the charges are too short, there will be less time to react to these waves that are coming out. And if it's too long, you will lose a lot of uptime. In terms of defensive usages, you will want to use your defensives when the boss gives everyone a dot with a volatile mutation and there's a spray happening at the same time. So like over here, there's going to be somewhat of an overlap coming up. That's also when you will want to be using your sack, spell ward, lay on hands and healer externals. Now because the boss only has two stacks with the cheese, there's not too much danger, but normally there would be a pretty bad overlap with the lava spray plus a dot. Like over here, Robbie would be taking massive damage, and this would be a very opportune moment to use your blessing of spell warding or blessing of sacrifice, or as a healer, some type of external. And of course, if you're a DPS, those are the times where you want to be using a defensive. So remember, volatile mutation plus lava spray overlap. Which we'll see exactly over here. There is a massive dot on Pete Zergling, plus a spray happening at the same time. Moving on to the next section, you will want to avoid the Hunters as much as possible. The Hunters are the most dangerous mobs here, these two mobs. Pulling this one Phoenix will also pull these two mobs. You could opt to skip this, but that will require some type of coordination since this Phoenix over here patrols. For this section, whenever the hunters jump and apply a bleed on someone, that bleed can be removed with either Evoker Cauterizing Flame or Dwarf Racial, as you can see here, or you can just use a big defensive for it. But it's also another good spot to be using Blessing of Sack if you're a prop paladin tank, or if you're a healer, you would want to use an external in those situations. The way I would like to play this area is just get aggro on mobs and deal damage to them as you're grouping them up. You can pull pretty big here, 
I would generally not recommend doing something as aggressive as this in a pug group. But if you're an organized group, there is a trick here where you can use the chains. So as you can see, we used one of the chains here. You can group up a ton of mobs and there will be these skulls that you can click on. Over here you can see a turtle from Robbie. He is getting ready to click on the chain. So he's got a chain debuff on right now and if you drag it over the mobs, it will blow up and do damage to the mobs as well as the person who is using the chain and everyone who is around it. So this is extremely dangerous to do in pugs, especially because of how much damage you can instantly do to your entire party, especially the melees. We have Twix here. He grabs a chain as well with dispersion. You can run it over the mobs and kaboom, it instantly kills all the mobs. This will save you a ton of time if you are able to pull massive and use the chains. Prompt Paladins also have a trick where they can not get the debuff and use the chain multiple times with Bubble. As you can see, every time you use the chain, there will be a debuff that stops you from using the chain again. However, that debuff can be removed with Bubble or any type of immunity like Ice Block. So here we have Goop with his Obsidian Scales running right into the mobs. After you quickly get rid of the trash, Chargaff will be next. With Chargaff, the most dangerous part is Dragon Strike. And the Grounding Spears right after. The Dragon Strike is a bleed that can also be removed with either Cauterizing Flame, like what just happened here, or Dwarf Ratio. The way you want to do the spears here is you will want two DPS to put the spears through the boss and one DPS stretch their chain out for the tank to pop. Right here is the perfect example of how it should be done. In our group, we have Robbie and Goop as the first ones popping the chain. So we have him placed him directly behind the boss, immediately run straight through the boss, not around, but straight through the boss. And the tank should keep the boss perfectly still. At the end of Fiery Focus, the boss will jump to the tank. The melees will want to get away from the boss, and the tank will want to not move the boss. So right here, the boss jumps in place, giving us immediately two stacks of the dot. And we will instantly want healing cooldowns or defensives. In this situation, we use Link. Twix has his chain stretched out, and we will want to pump that last chain once we're stable. The boss also takes a massive amount of additional damage here. So you'll want to have all your burst in this window. After Chargaff, we can skip this hunter if you have something like Sleepwalk. Otherwise, don't worry about it, just pull it. And there will be another chain that we can use. And again, we do the same thing. You get aggro, Hit mobs for a bit, start grouping up trash, make sure we have big defensives, like here I have a meta just for this. Once the mobs group up, we can use some CCs and start popping the chain. So I grab first. That's the first one. We cap totem. Here comes a second one with Twix and Dispersion. He runs right through. Boom. Finishes most of the mobs. And then we have one more chain from Robbie. He turtles, disengages right on top of the mobs, and it finishes off the rest of the mobs. You really don't require DPS cooldowns in these situations. You will want to save DPS cooldowns and you will want to try using as many chains as possible with defensives. So over here too, there should be a cauldron. Someone with 25 dragonflight cooking can use which gives us this action button that has three usages. It gives us a massive move speed buff, 65% until we get into combat. This hunter here will want to skip. As I've mentioned before, hunters are never worth fighting. Since it's asleep, you can just walk right by. In this upstairs area, you will primarily be wanting to kick the flares, their melt cast and using whatever AOE CCs you can. So here we use some kicks, silence sigil, another set of casts right here as you can see, chaos nova, 
and just finish out of a pull. After this pack, you will ideally once again fight as little trash here as possible. The count here is really not good and the mobs are very dangerous. So you can skip this pack up ahead by just hugging along the right side, leading you into the mini boss. This mini boss for the most part is actually pretty easy. So you can fight it with these two lava bearers here that give a ton of count and they are also extremely easy. If you have a Prop Paladin or Vengeance, you can also pull in these two flares, as long as you have the kicks locked down. So with a Prop Paladin, you would have Avenger Shield Interrupts, and with a Demon Hunter, you have Silent Sigil for them. The most dangerous part here with pulling these two flares is a Melt plus the mini boss AoE going off at the same time. So clear out the rest of the trash here and there will be a bone splitter that you will want to watch out for. It does a pierce marrow cast on someone and it also does a dragon bone axe bleed. Those two abilities you can use an external as you can see here that one bone splitter almost killed Twix in one hit. You'll want to be using your blessing of sacks and cc's and stops on these bone splitters. So once again fight as little as possible, go down into the boss room. Clear out the trash, and we're on to the boss. On this boss, when you pull the boss, it'll start doing massive AoE damage right away. So make sure you have healing ready, make sure the healer is full of mana, and make sure everyone's pulling this with full HP. This is one of the harder bosses. With this boss, you'll want to use defensives on every Might of the Forge, as it'll go straight into a very nasty dot. This is also where you want to be using your Blessing of Sacrifice and Spell Warding rotating on someone non-stop. In this situation, I would use it on the Shadow Priest because of how much damage they take without Disperse. One other tip is to try always having Lust on this boss and always try fighting on the same side. There will always be line of sight issues, especially with certain character heights. So if you are not fighting on the same z-axis or roughly on the same side, you will have a lot of healing problems. Aside from that, there is not a whole lot else you can do on this boss. This will mostly come down to the healer and how much defensiveness your group has. This is a situation where Prop Paladin would help a lot. After finishing this boss, you will want to use another charge of your Ghoulash, so that you can get to the middle quickly. Now if you did everything right at this point, you should have plenty of time left, as you can see we have 12 minutes on a 23 here. You could take this slow, but if you do feel like you're capable of tanking more mobs, you can do a double pull here. These mobs don't do anything to the group, they only do tank damage, except for the Blazewing. The Blazewing will be the only group damage mob. You'll want to be using your externals like Blessing of Sacrifice and Spell Warding on the Tempest Wing cast from the Blaze Wing. Aside from that, it's just hit and kick the Lava Mancer and survive as a tank. This entire area here gives massive count. So this is where we want to make up for all the count that we skipped out on earlier. Moving on to the last boss here, the general strategy will be to keep the person with Molten Gold alive. This is where you want to be using your Spell Wardings and Blessing of Sack again, or Healer Externals and Defensive CDs if you are a DPS. And as for the items, as a tank you will ideally want at least two items in this situation. I have this weak aura tracking that I have a charge and a range wand. Picking up more than two items can be very RNG because if you pick up two of the same items, it will not work and it will just consume one of the gold piles. I believe you want four to five total items to break the shield, which means if the tank has two, you can have the healer also taking two or you can have each person grabbing one. And as long as you get four to five items off, it will be enough to break the shield. Once you get your items, you should also try to tank the boss on top of the embers and use single target stuns on the ember. If you pull your damage properly, 
The boss should die pretty quickly because of all the extra damage the boss takes after the shield is broken. If you made it this far and if you happen to have a clean run, you should have plenty of time in this dungeon. Generally, as long as you get Magma Tusk over with and as long as you don't pull any of the bad mobs and if you can somehow use the chains, you should have a pretty easily timed Nofaris. Of course, on Fortified Week, you might want to take a little bit slower and doing chains plus trash will be kind of deadly, but the bosses will be a lot easier. Anyways, that is it for the video. If you guys found this helpful, let me know down below. I could do this for other dungeons. I'll see how people feel about it. But hopefully this helps a lot with Nefaris. Thank you for watching.